Shalom lekulam. I will speak in English because we record this for all the people who can make it. And my name is Shir, as it all said, and I'm a data scientist at Bluevine. And first of all, I want to say on a personal note that I'm very happy to be here today. It was uh, my personal goal to create a community of professionals that I can talk with and consult with. And it's really happening here, so thank you all guys for making it happen. And, and that's it, and let's start. So uh, um, my talk would be composed of two parts. The first part would be a story of a model I worked on at my job, and about a little about continuous model training. And the second part would be uh, about a model explanation framework called LIME, which help us interpret our models in a deeper way than we usually do. So uh, let's start with the first part. Uh, I was asked to build a model for returning clients and returning debtors at Bluevine. And now you probably don't understand what it means. So for you to understand better, uh, you need to know what is Bluevine. So I prepared a short movie to explain that. Maybe you're the CEO of a marketing agency or you're an engineering consultant. You might even tame elephants for a living. But no matter what you do, it often seems like what you end up doing most is waiting. Yes, waiting to get your invoices paid. Waiting and waiting and waiting. These cash flow gaps make it hard to manage expenses. Also, if you could get the money now, you could reinvest it in growing your business. Now you can. Introducing Bluevine, a fast and easy way to get an advance on your invoices. Signing up with Bluevine is easy. Enter a few details about yourself and your business, and connect your invoicing or accounting software. Your unpaid invoices will automatically appear in your dashboard. Select one or more invoices to advance with a click of a button. You can get cash in as little as 24 hours for your first invoice advance, and even sooner for repeat usage. So how does your customer pay Bluevine when the invoice is due? Once you're approved on Bluevine, you'll receive a Bluevine account, a unique bank account number, and a physical P.O. Box address, both in your business name. With the bank account number, you will be able to accept electronic payments, and with your P.O. Box, checks. And since your Bluevine account is in your name, your customers can continue making the payments in your name. Sign up with Bluevine, stop waiting, and free up your cash today. Bluevine, fast funding, simple and transparent, 100% online. Okay, so now you understand what Bluevine does. We actually help small businesses get advance on their invoices. Uh, and now to connect you to the model I had to work with, I had to explain you the terms. What is a client and what is a debtor and what is a returning client and debtor? So for example, say that you are an exterminator, you exterminate bugs. And a law firm uh, asks you to come and uh, make a job for them. And you come there and you do your job, uh, but you don't get paid immediately. You get paid in the, the end of the month or in 60 days according to the terms of your deal. Um, so uh, you want the money now because you need to pay your workers or you need to invest in marketing. Uh, uh, then you come to us, to Bluevine, and you give us, give us your invoice. We give you an advance on your invoice. And uh, in, in the end of the month, when a payment is due, uh, the debtor just, the, the law firm just pays us directly uh, the money. So this is what it's called factoring. And this is a very large business in the United States. There are very many, many companies that does that. But what's so special in Bluevine is that it's 100% online and also that we are all machine learning model-based uh, decisions. So everything happens really fast. A client can get money to his account in just a few hours. Um, so one of these very smart models I had to work on is a model for returning clients and returning debtors, meaning clients that we already had deals with. For example, if this exterminator has already done a deal before and got funding from Bluevine and, and he did this deal with the same law firm before, then this is a, a deal that I would uh, train on in my model. Okay, so uh, um, this is the model I had to build. and and. First of all, I have to generate the data. 
So I have, of course, features of the deal itself, the amount of money and the duration of the deal. But I also have features of the client because this is a client we already worked with. So we know about the history of his payments and what is his standing in the banks. Um, in addition, I have information about the debtor because we already worked with this debtor as well. Um, my, um, my model goals is to actually predict whether this will be a good deal. Uh, because what we want to do, we want to approve this deal automatically without uh, uh, an analyst touch, without no one seeing it. Um, so what, what does it mean that a deal is good? It means that we approved it and that it was paid on time, on terms. And uh, this is an example of a data frame um, from my data that I use. Uh, just an example of three features of uh, my whole data set. I have many features. One of the features is client negative web appearances. This is, for example, one of the features we collect on our clients. And as you can see, it's a, it's a binary feature, binary feature, true or false. And we have a feature of debt or average invoices amount. It's a numerical feature. And a feature of the deal, the duration of the deal. And is good is the label, as I said, whether the deal is good and is paid on terms. So what can we see here? That there is a mixture of different types of features. There are a, a binary features, there are numerical features, maybe there are also categorical features. So this is not uh, trivial in machine learning because many machine learning models make assumptions on the, on the features that they are maybe normally distributed or uh, Bernoulli distributed. Uh, if you want to use machine learning models when they are from mixture of different types, you need to do something. Maybe you should change your data to all of the data being binary. Or maybe you need to change your model to tr treat differently the uh, binary uh, variables and treat differently the numerical variables. Or you can do something else and it just use a tree-based model. Uh, and why use a tree-based model? Because it doesn't make any assumption on the underlying distribution of the data. And it's very, it's very good for these kind of problems. Uh, but I don't just use a, a decision tree, a classical decision tree. Uh, I use, for example, random forest. And why do we like random forest so much? Random forest is a combination of many decision trees. Um, do you hear me in the back? It's okay? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, as I said, random forest is a combination of many decision trees, meaning that, first of all, they can work with a, with a mixture of different type of features, as I said. But uh, they're also better than single decision trees because they are a, a, an average of many decision trees built on different subsets on the data of the data and different subsets of the feature. By creating these different uh, decision trees, which are different from another, and averaging the results, we create a low variance model, which means it has also a lower error. So uh, it makes it uh, much more robust. In addition, what's very good in tree-based models and in random forest is that it has a way to capture the relation between features very well. For example, if I would use a linear model, then if I would want to capture the relation between two features, I would have to add another feature, for example, with a ratio of two features or with a, a other a kind of function between the two features. But when I use trees, uh, which is actually, in the end, just a bunch of rules combined together, then it, it gives space to uh, very complex functions uh, with different features from the data. So uh, I took a random forest, and I, uh, um, just another thing uh, I need to address too here, uh, that I have an unbalanced data set, like in most fraud detection problems, I only have about 3% 3, 3 bad deals. And just to clarify, what are bad deals for us? Uh, bad deals are deals that were rejected by our analyst or something like that, or deals that were approved but in the end was not paid on terms. Okay, so I also have to address this problem in the data and how people usually uh, uh, handle uh, unbalanced uh, uh, issues is by uh, oversampling the minority class or undersampling the majority class. So then I decided to just go on and try a model on my data. 
the model I was trying to, to build was already uh, is already an existing version. This is actually the second version of this model. And I said, well, the, the data should be pretty good. Let's just go and see what happens when I throw everything to random forest and do tenfold cross-validation. Let's see what are the results. And then I got this. Wow, looks amazing, right? For those of you, of you who are not familiar with this kind of plot, this is a rock curve. And what we see here is the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And the blue line is the new perfect model. And the green line is the old model, which is OK. Um, and uh, what you can see, for example, in this point I marked there, there is a very, very high uh, true, uh, true positive rate, around 95%, and very, very low false positive rate, close to zero. So it's perfect result. I can go home, go to the beach, have fun. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, then I looked again and I said, well, data doesn't act like this. Usually, just like that, you get perfect results. Uh, so I decided uh, to dig in and do some experiments and understand where, where is the problem. So uh, <coughs> first of all, I looked at the model feature importance. Uh, feature importance is the estimation of the reduction of accuracy of the model if you remove a feature from the model. And the first one is like the most uh, important feature of the model, and this is by the order. And I looked for anything, I don't know, something weird that will look weird in the eyes, an idea, tar something that's leaking the target. Um, and, uh, and what I saw was pretty normal. I mean, I looked at uh, the features and I'm like, OK, client payment history 2, client payment history 3. It's all kind of variations on the, on the knowledge we have about the payment history of the client, which is pretty logical. I mean, we already have information about the client. We already worked with it. It's the best prediction to how it's going to behave now, right? So nothing seemed weird to me. Uh, also, the deal amount is very logical that it will be in the feature importance. Um, so I decided to try something else and make some experiments. I took only the 10 best features and uh, did again cross-validation on my model only with the 10 best features. And look, I still got really amazing results. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what to do, why, why, how to, to ruin this model. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I tried something else. I took the 10 worst features, <laughs> and this is what I got. Still really good results. Um, so uh, I, uh, then I just said, OK, maybe we'll just go crazy and just take two features. And still, I got pretty good results for two features only, two the two best features, but still only two features. And so well, something here is weird. But if we use only two features, it's supposed to be a pretty uh, a simple model. Maybe I can just look at one of the trees from the random forest and understand what is the problem. So I plotted one of the trees, just a random tree from my model. And this is what I got. <laughs> really, really huge tree. Uh, you can't understand much because it's just really, really huge. But what you can understand is that this tree has many, many leaves. And all of this just based on two features. So it lights, I don't know, a candle or something, a light lamp under my head that the model is memorizing something, is learning specific values of something. But what? I mean, I do cross-validation right. I, I take some deals, train the model on them. I take other deals and test the model on them. Wh why, what is it memorizing? So, <clears throat> do you have any ideas what could have happened here? <laughs> Maybe bad leakage because of the features history basically computed on the entire time window for data set when you cross validate basically leak information. Okay, that's a very good point, but no, it can't happen because I didn't talk about it. Uh, but my data generation is not that simple. I don't just take all the client features at the moment. I take all the client features as they were at the time of the deal creation. Only the history of the client, which was true at the time of the deal creation. So I don't actually leak information about the specific deal uh, for, for, uh, uh, when I generate the data. 
Yes. Uh, did you limit the size of the tree? Uh, that's a very good point, and I actually tried that, but I still got really bad results, and I would explain later why, but it's a really good idea. Uh, okay, now I will continue because we don't have my t much time, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so I tried to do something else, and instead of just randomly uh, 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 doing cross-validation, I decided to divide my data in a different way, in a way that will simulate the future better. And how did I do that? We didn't talk about it, but um, many of our uh, clients are returning clients. The clients make many deals with Bluevine. And also my data set, it includes many deals from the same client. And I didn't think about it, but maybe there's something important here. So um, I decided instead of doing cross-validation, uh, just randomly, uh, I did something else. I trained the model on certain deals from certain clients, and I tested the, bono, the model on deals from other clients, the clients that the model have not seen on train. And this was the result I got. Pretty lame. <laughs> uh, and then I said, oh no, bring back my beautiful rock. It was so nice. I so wanted to once have such a great model, but no. Um, so this uh, uh, really uh, led me to the to understand that here is the problem, here is my problem, and uh, what is exactly the problem? Um, so probably the the classifier instead of learning a deal, it is memorizing the clients. And what does it mean? Why does it memorize the client? So. We have to ask three questions to understand this better. First of all, how many deals per client do we have in our data? How many, uh, uh, how many times a client will repeat in my data? Second of all, is client behavior per consistent? Do usually clients with good deals have only good deals or clients with bad deals only have bad deals? And third, how similar are deals from the same client? Can the model really recognize a certain deal is from a certain client? Um, so uh, let's check all of these three points. So this is the deal per client count. Uh, it's a histogram of the number of deals per client. And what we can see here that, well, yeah, most of the client in our data has multiple deals, around 90%. And some of them even have dozens and hundreds of deals uh, in my data. So it will maybe make the model it will make the model easier uh, to learn the specific clients so yes on the first one um, and then uh, i wanted to check uh, is the client behavior really consistent so uh, i went to look and i saw that we always approve the client we always approve our 75% client with good deals and we always reject 10% of the client, and only for 50, for 14% of the clients, the, the behavior is not consistent. Meaning that yes, if the model can learn to recognize a specific client which is good, it will approve all these deals and get perfect result on them. Uh, and the same for a bad client. And then I went to check how similar are deals from the same client, and I got this random uh, uh, plot of similarity between deals and in dark purple we see high similarity and light purple is low similarity and the diagonal is all a uh, uh, dark purple because deals are similar to themselves but we see here another uh, uh, dark purple and this is because deal 5 is from client 15 and deal 1 is on also from client 15 that's why they are very similar so this also backs my assumption that these from the same client are similar but let's see it on the whole data set this is just a small example so what i did to check on the whole data set if these from the same client are actually similar i am um, calculated for each deal what is the most similar deal in the data. And then I took all of these values of similarity, similarity is from 0 to 1, uh, and I took all these values of maximum similarity and plotted, uh, plotted this on a histogram. And as you can see here, there is a high peak around 1, meaning that most of the deals has at least one very similar deal in my data set. 
So it backs my assumption that if I have many deals from the same client, they are very similar. Uh, another thing I checked is how many features of my features are client features because I said deal features and data features and client features and as you can see here 71% of my features are client features which is a lot so it's logical it would be uh, easy to learn the specific clients. Um, so the conclusion from all of these check that is actually this model just learn, memorize uh, the clients instead of learning the pattern of a good deal. So, any ideas how can we solve this issue? Use labels, labels. What, what do you mean by that? Meaning that each false will uh, contain different clients. I don't understand. Only one uh, each of your votes will contain uh, will will be built from different clients. Okay, but I do that. I, I divided the train and the test are from different clients already. That's what I did in my K fold. Okay. Okay. Maybe you have. Maybe I don't understand you, but you can tell me later. <laughs> Any other ideas? Well, yes. Example: just one transaction per client. Okay, uh, good idea. <laughs> good idea, Alan. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alan got it right. Uh, what I did um, is actually just take my data set and shrink it a lot, just sample one deal per client. Uh, and then if I take the measure I showed you before of similarity between deals, from this blue peak we see here, we receive this red thing which is much more flatter it means that a uh, um, deals has much less similar deals in the data set so i got a data set which is less correlated the samples are less correlated it's decorrelated um, but i still have uh, a problem now that uh, i have a much smaller sample size so how can i deal with that so what i did in the end uh, my final solution is um, using an ensemble. Instead of just taking one deal per client and training a model and that, it, that would be my model, I did it a few times and the final model is an ensemble model based on the average of the decision of all of these models trained on different deals per client but only one deal per client. And here are some results. What we can see here from left to right, this is the result for only one classifier for random forest. The blue for the new model and the green for the old one. And I added more and more classifiers. And we can see some mild improvement here uh, in the raw curve, but it's not amazing, yes. Um, and then uh, to make my model stronger, I decided to try something else, something new I heard about lately. Uh, which is called ECGBoost. Uh, you probably heard about it as well. Uh, it's a Kaggle uh, champion winner. It uh, won most of the, of the competition of Kaggle this year. It has uh, some part in the winning solution. And as you can see, it got me really great results. Uh, so I was very happy. And, and it's also based on trees. It's just based on boosting, which sequentially build trees which learns from the from the previous trees mistakes so it's a uh, more uh, robust than random forest um, and then uh, i got uh, this nice result of uh, a, a point, uh, 0 0.077 rock which is uh, okay let's go into production this is enough for us uh, but then i had just one more problem the problem is that how models usually work is that they are trained offline and the prediction is done online and this is great if we assume that the world is not changing that the world is stationary um, but in fact the world is not like that uh, people are changing and our policies for improvement of deal change all the time um, and we have to deal with that somehow so what we did is build a fr framework to continuously train the models online uh, without our intervention. And how it works is that the model is trained every week on the most updated data. It just reads the data from the database, trains the model, 
and we deploy the new model only if it's comparable or better or better than the old model and in this way we prevent the model from degrading and also prevent it from getting irrelevant uh, so uh, that's it for the first part do you have any questions yes Uh, it's a very good point. What, what do you mean stale? About a month, something like that. Did you try combining the boosting in uh, bagging? It's a good idea. I might try that in the next revision. But uh, I, I, I'm not sure it will make better results because, well, but maybe, yeah. Maybe if I do stacking. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Uh, more? Yes? Um, given that about only about 50% of your clients are those who are not always yes or always no, why don't you want to build a model to classify a client as being uh, either totally safe, totally bad, and then take only the chunks of the left and then build the model about tossing away uh, most of the deals on them? I mean, build the client level model versus transaction level. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get you. But maybe you want to come here, so I'll so hear you better. Classify the clients and not the transactions. I think that's the idea. Classify the clients and not the transactions. Because I, did, I have different amount of data on each client, and I want to, to be able to, to give an answer about a certain deal and use also the deal features. So it's a different problem. We also have models that, that work only about clients and about approve, uh, improvement of clients. But this is a model specific for deals and for returning clients. So I hope that answers it. But if you want, you can, we can talk about it later. OK, so let's move on to the second part, because we still have more things we want to talk about. Um, so in the first part, we saw a model that worked perfectly on validation data, but in fact was not good at all. It was just memorizing the clients instead of uh, learning what is a good deal. Um, and this is uh, one of my motivations to look at something like this, uh, a model explanation. Usually uh, machine learning models are very complex and we can't really understand how they work. We just treat them as a black box, we train them and then we test them on other data and see their performance, that's how we evaluate if they're working. We just test them on validation but we don't actually look inside them and, and see how they work. So this is a really cool framework developed by guys from Washington University. It's called Lime, and it's a framework that can explain any machine learning model. It explains specific predictions of the model. It actually gives reasons why does this sample uh, was uh, 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 predicted to be good or bad or whatever is the label. So I will show a few examples. First of all, a picture of dogs. So uh, it would be something nice also in the presentation. <laughs> um, and this is uh, my uh, example of uh, data leakage. Um, the, the Lime guys, what they did, uh, they took the Google uh, Inception network and they gave it photos of wolves and photos of Eskimo dogs, husky dogs. It's cute things here. And they wanted uh, to train the network to distinguish between these two types of dogs. Um, so, uh, but they also want to confuse the network. So what they did, they took only photos of wolves with snow in the background and photos of husky dogs with some background but not snow. Okay? And the, net the network uh, performed uh, uh, perfectly on the validation data of this sort. It recognized all the wolves and wo as wolves and all the husky dogs as husky dogs. But then they gave uh, the network uh, this photo of a husky with snow in the background. And of course, what the network said, it said that this is a wolf because it has snow in the background. And what Lime produces is the pixels that mostly contributed to this prediction. And in this case, you can see the explanation is the snow in the background. So the network, instead of learning to recognize the differences of the, in the faces of the wolves and dogs, just learn to recognize that if it's snow, then it's a wolf. <laughs> uh, so it's a nice uh, 
nice way to show what is data leakage. Uh, data leakage is, in fact, when you have features in the data which reveal the target. Uh, and these features would not be actually present as is in the real world. So it makes your model actually really bad because it learns the, the data leakage instead of learning the right patterns you want to know. So it's kind of similar to what I had, but, but different. Um, so another nice, uh, th this was an example of how Lime can show you when a model is bad, is learning the wrong thing. And uh, now this is an example of how Lime can uh, uh, show your model is also good. Uh, this is a photo of a Labrador playing a guitar. And the Google Inception Network also, uh, it gave three predictions. It tried to recognize what is in this photo. It gave three predictions. The first, the strongest one was electric guitar, which is not entirely true because this is an acoustic guitar. But the explanation you see here of an electric guitar is actually the part that looks like an electric guitar. So it makes sense. Um, it said also acoustic guitar, and it's very reasonable because it shows the parts of the guitar that looks like acoustic guitar. And it also said a Labrador, and uh, the pixel that we explained it is the Labrador face. So uh, we see that the prediction is not perfect, but the reasons are very logical. Um, so we, we can trust this network that it does logical uh, uh, assumptions. Um, so what is Lime? Um, Lime is uh, generated actually just by taking the very complex model and trying to estimate it locally around the sample we want to explain. Um, here, for example, you have uh, this specific cross. This is, for example, a, 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 an example you want to explain. And the classification border between the two classes is very complex, as you can see. And what Lime does actually is to estimate this line. And if we know this line, we can understand this model better because a linear model is much more interpretable than uh, uh, this complex model. And how does it do that? It creates uh, uh, examples which are similar to this example just by adding random noise to this example. And it creates prediction, predictions for these uh, additional uh, examples. And then uh, it creates a linear estimation from, uh, from that to the model uh, around that uh, sample. Uh, and then what we in fact look at uh, in the explanation are the specific features which were the strongest in this linear line. Um, and just the last thing I want to show you to close the loop, to make us a closure, is that I applied Lime. I took it and applied it on my initial model and on my final model. And as you can see here, uh, I, took a, I took a specific example of a client, which is a bad deal. Um, and what you see, uh, this is the text that Lime can produce. It says uh, the features and the values of the features, and here, uh, it's the contribution, it is a, a plus if it's for the good side uh, of the deal, if, if you say it's a good deal, and minus if you say it's a bad deal. And here also in columns, the good and the bad features and the list of the features. And you can see also the code here. I can send you the code later if you want. You can also find it at Google. Um, and uh, you can see that this is the initial model. And all the features here, by Lime say that this model's, uh, this uh, deal is bad, which is a bit weird because all of the features here are, first of all, client-specific features, and all of them are numerical. And if you s look at the ranges, they are very specific. For example, client history one, this is some feature which talk about the history of the client, not necessarily bad or good. If it is between 1400 and 2100, it says it is very bad. This implies that it learns specific values of this feature and says it's bad. So it actually learns the client. Um, so we can just see what we saw in the first part, but through Lime here, that this uh, model just learned the client instead of uh, 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 learning the pattern of good deals. And if we look at the final model, 
Uh, we see that the prediction is also correct, as it was in the first, uh, uh, in the first model, in the addition model. But the reasons here are right. Because if we look at the good column and the bad column, in the good column we have, for example, client bad history is zero, which is good because the, the bad history for this client is zero, it's something good. So it's logical that it would be in the good column. And client, client bad history is far, this is larger than zero, then it's, it's logical that this would be something bad. Um, so here it's much more balanced pictures, not everything is bad and it makes sense. So um, this is how we can use Lime. And that's it, that was my talk. Um, we talked about a model with perfect uh, validation results, which was in fact useless because it just memorized the client. And we talk about how uh, uh, I, um, I found a solution for this problem by assembling a few models trained on one deal per client uh, uh, data sets. And we talk about how to deal with the non-stationary world by uh, keep on uh, uh, training our model online on production. And uh, in the end, we showed an explanation <laughs> framework that enables us to understand any machine learning model and open up the black boxes. And that's it. If you have questions. Uh, so thank you. And we are hiring. <laughs> and this is my email. You can also send me questions or send your CV if you're interested. And that's it. Yes. Uh, did line work pretty much out of the box, or did you have to like uh, play a lot of the types of perturbations that it's doing before it gave you meaningful results? It just works. It's really amazing. <laughs> really, really easy. You just give it the model, you give it the features names, and it just works. Yeah, really great. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. It seems you're wasting out of your data, but because you're taking one transaction per uh, per classifier. Yeah. Well, you could do that, like somebody's mentioned here before, just use, just separate the clients per uh, fault. And then you can use all the transactions of a client in a as long as they're in a single fault. So, isn't it the same? But now the number of transactions per client that you can take is limited by the number of, of classifiers you have in your ensemble. But if you have, I don't know, hundreds of transactions per client, you're not using all of them. Yes, but if I will use all of them at once, then the model would memorize the clients instead. No, but it will not. It will never be this. It will never be the same time in the training and the testing. Yeah, the validation the training, results won't be as good. But yeah, the, the validation will. results would not be good, but the model would not learn the right thing. I want to l the model to learn. And the minute I supply the model many deals from the same client, it recognizes ah, this client is. Uh, uh, good because all of this deal is good uh, so instead of learning the pattern of good deals it learns what is this client how to recognize this specific client so the features for every transaction transaction are the same for uh, for the client it's not exactly the same there might be some changes because time changes of course and maybe deals are from different times um, but they they are similar that's what we see in fact yeah okay i'll continue the question. Yeah, sure. Yes. You mentioned that you automatically retrain the model and then compare it and change it in production. So what is the method that you use exactly to compare and to see if the model is worth switching to the next one? Uh, it's a very good question. I actually use all three metrics I have. I use rock and I use precision and I use recall because um, we, we do have some threshold to when we approve deals and I want to keep some precision and recall. Uh, for this threshold. So validation results? Yeah, the validation results. What I do, um, I didn't t talk about it too much, but I told you that I switched on uh, uh, the validation. Instead of doing cross-validation, I do validation only on deals uh, from clients that the model have not seen. So that's what I do along the whole way. I do tenfold validation, but in this way, like Monte Carlo, I sample. Okay. Yes? Um, you said that you only change the model if you see a improvement in the results, but wouldn't that be a case that if you have uh, somebody finding new ways to trick the model, they realize what you're doing, there's that if your results get worse, I mean, 
how do you catch um, something just being adapted to what your model is identifying? It can give worse results, but that's a bit more accurate than your model being thinking that it's doing better when it's just being tripped in some cases, especially when you're only in the higher down sampling. That's actually a good point. Um, I haven't think about it yet, but I, let's say it just it's not that easy to trick our models. I mean, it's based on many, many features together, and you need to forge a lot of things to, to get to, to specifically understand what the model is uh, approving. But that's an idea. We, we will see it over time. I mean, this is pretty new. So, some companies in this space letting some bad users get through. Uh, to validate that those are the bad deals and then use it for uh, the leveling. Mm -hmm. That's funny. So this, this, this relates to our secret sauce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. We have plenty of time, out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Upa? Okay. okay, so we'll just take five minutes break and then we'll continue with the next lecture. Thank you all. Thank you.